Hi, everyone. My name is Yasmin Okan, and I am an associate professor in behavioral decision making, working together with the Center for Decision Research uh, as part of uh, Leeds University Business School. And today I would like to share with you my experience working on a uh, mixed method study that involved uh, the use of cognitive think aloud interviews uh, followed by an online survey. Um, so uh, the first thing that I want to, to say uh, as a disclaimer is that I am not an expert uh, in qualitative methods. Um, my background is in experimental psychology and typically I conduct um, online experiments, surveys uh, and so on that involve a quantitative approach. So this was relatively new to me, um, this sort of mixed methods uh, approach when I, when I started working on this project, but I'm hoping that my experience will be uh, useful for you to, to give you a sense of how someone without specific background uh, in this kind of methodology can conduct um, a study like this, some of the challenges, questions that um, I faced and some of the solutions uh, and some of the um, sort of general thoughts and, and reflections and, and take home messages. So, um, First of all, just to give you uh, some background, this um, study was part of a project that was funded by Cancer Research UK that aimed to improve the effectiveness of web-based communications about cervical screening using graphs. Okay, so we had three different um, steps. The first one involved examining how information about cervical screening is communicated in, in UK websites. The second one involved identifying women's difficulties in interpreting the NHS cervical screening um, leaflet. And then the final one involved uh, testing redesigned web-based communications about cervical screening. So today we will be focusing on the second step and more specifically, I'll be talking about um, the paper that you can see up on the screen. There we reported the, the findings of the interviews and of the follow-up um, survey. This is available uh, open access, so you can just Google it and you can download it. Otherwise, I can share a copy with you if you if you want. And you can also access the materials and the data um, at the Open Science Framework. So uh, just to um, briefly uh, mention uh, what cervical screening involves, in case some of you are not familiar with the details, um, this is offered to women um, between 25 and 64 across the UK. Some of you may have been invited, some of you may have attended already. And um, those who are eligible are mailed an invitation letter and a leaflet that includes information about cervical cancer as well as different um, aspects related to, to screening. And the aim of this leaflet is to support informed choices about uh, screening participation. However, we know from previous research that communications about screening often um, includes information that can be uh, complex for people. Uh, and by the way, the um, cover that you can see there up on the slide is the, um, is the old one. Uh, uh, so this is for the old version of the, of the leaflet that we tested um, a couple of years ago uh, in this study. Um, however, since then, a new version has been released. So if you go to the um, NHS website or, or you receive your invitation in the, in the post, you will see a different cover. So what we wanted to do in this mixed method study was to, first of all, assess women's responses to and potential difficulties uh, interpreting the leaflet. So for this, we conducted qualitative cognitive think aloud interviews. And the second um, study aim was to assess the prevalence of difficulties and responses in the population. Uh, so in other words, how common these responses uh, or difficulties were, and also to explore whether these difficulties and responses um, were related to participant characteristics such as uh, different demographics. So for this, we needed to conduct a um, um, quantitative survey um, where um, we, uh, first of all, before actually running the survey, uh, we tested the survey items um, iteratively using cognitive interviews. So I'll also be uh, discussing those uh, briefly later on. So taken together, um, here we are, uh, if we consider these two sort of two, two steps uh, taken together, we, we are using an, an exploratory uh, sequential mixed methods uh, approach where the qualitative phase uh, is described as exploratory because it is mainly um, data driven and then insights from the qualitative analysis informed the development of the survey. So what did we do then uh, for our first step, the, the think aloud interviews? 
we asked women to vocalize their thoughts while they were reading the leaflets uh, in a nutshell. Um, the think aloud method generally um, provides access to the cognitive processes that occur during a task, and it's often used to identify a potential usability problem. Certainly, uh, this method has been used quite a lot in uh, literature and psychology, but I'm sure there are other fields as well um, that, that do tend to use it quite a lot. And um, what we did was to recruit um, 20 women um, who were eligible for cervical screening according to their age uh, and so on, uh, with the help of LUTO, that uh, is a health communications uh, testing company that was based in, in Leeds. Uh, and this was pre-COVID uh, time, so we uh, conducted the interviews face-to-face. -face. I invited participants to come to the university and we were sitting in a room and I, and I interviewed them face-to-face. Uh, and in case you're wondering, by the way, the sample size was um, based on uh, related think aloud research and also evidence uh, from, from the literature that um, between 10 and 15 interviews tend to be enough typically to identify most usability issues or themes, but we, we wanted to um, conduct a few, a few more. So um, we used uh, purposive sampling to ensure that we had some diversity in terms of age and um, education. Now, before we actually conducted the main round of interviews, we um, had four pilot interviews to test and refine the protocol. And I would strongly encourage you to, to do so, particularly if you don't have experience interviewing. Um, as in, as in my case. So I did find this uh, really helpful to, for example, um, make decisions about aspects such as whether we should use a marked or an unmarked protocol. So um, in, in this context where you're asking people to read uh, information from a leaflet, a marked protocol would involve um, asking people to read out the information and think aloud every time they encounter a red asterisk or dot or whatever you want to include there uh, in the text as a prompt um, to, to get them to, to think aloud. So where did this idea come from? There were two papers that inspired us to do so. Uh, the first one, you can see the reference up there on the slide, uh, basically uh, assigned college students to read um, three passages in three different presentation modes, either using a marked protocol, an art mark, unmarked protocol, or just um, a control condition. So I'm not going to go into the details of the results. You can read more about it if you, if you want. Uh, if you access the paper, but basically what they concluded is that the marked protocol may provide a more veridical picture of text processing. And that in fact, readers may be more likely to indicate when they are getting something, they, they may be more likely to verbalize questions, paraphrase things and so on, um, than uh, when uh, the protocol is unmarked. So they may be more likely to um, avoid um, just, um, how, how can I put this? Uh, things that are otherwise automatic uh, become um, more explicit, more overt. They start uh, verbalizing more frequently, saying things like, oh yeah, right, I see this is very clear and so on. Those things generally happen automatically. And the idea is that with a MAC protocol, these are more likely to, uh, these things are more likely to be verbalized and also uh, they argue that uh, readers may be more likely to indicate when they are not getting something. In other words, they may be more likely to overcome the social stigma that is associated with admitting that you are struggling to understand something. Sam Smith, who was um, a collaborator in this project, he in fact is a co-author in the, in the paper, um, had also conducted um, a study where he uh, looked at how people interpreted the um, NHS leaflet about colorectal cancer in this case, and he also used um, think aloud interviews uh, using uh, a MARC protocol. So um, in this case, he didn't really compare different presentation modes, but in his experience, uh, this procedure was helpful to elicit instances of confusion and miscomprehension. So um, taking this into account, I sort of looked at both uh, approaches in the pilot interviews. And in my experience, the MARC protocols were indeed more effective um, to um, basically avoid situations where people were just forgetting to think aloud and they just continued reading uh, and reading uh, without, without verbalizing their thoughts. 
we um, therefore went for this approach. We included asterisks at the end of bullet points, short paragraphs, as well as long sentences to, to break up things. Uh, and the, these criteria were uh, pretty much adapted from Sam's um, previous work. And there you can see an example of the uh, text that was included in the leaflet and the little asterisks at the end, in this case of the first sentence and then of the second um, paragraph. Those sentences are not too long, but for longer sentences, as I mentioned, we included an asterisk after each sentence. Uh, and overall, these prompts to think aloud were quite frequent. We had around uh, 70 marks in total across the leaflet. So um, here you have an overview of what we, we did. Um, overall, um, before actually conducting the think aloud task, we um, gave participants standardized instructions. I'll show you the, uh, the details in a second. And then we also uh, gave them a practice leaflet to help them to feel more comfortable with this um, think aloud um, procedure. Uh, we then moved on to the actual think aloud task uh, in relation to the leaflet. We also had some additional um, open-ended questions at the end, uh, focusing on aspects that we were particularly interested in. Uh, but importantly, we left those until the, the end so they wouldn't interfere with the think aloud task. Uh, and then we also administered a um, questionnaire that they could fill in, just providing some additional demographics and uh, information about participants' um, characteristics. So there you have the think aloud instructions that we used. Um, you can read uh, these more slowly in your own time if you wish, uh, but basically these were adapted from uh, the two papers that I mentioned earlier. Uh, it took us a little bit of time and, and discussion to figure out what would be the, 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 the best aspects to emphasize here. Um, but you can see uh, that, for example, we were um, telling them that they could uh, make predictions about what they were reading or rephrase what they uh, felt or they thought that the text was saying, um, discuss something that they were familiar with or comment on something that was confusing and, and so on. And, and one consideration here was that we wanted to avoid reactivity. Uh, in other words, we wanted to avoid artificially affecting performance or accuracy through the instructions given. This has been discussed a lot in the literature in psychology at least. Um, so to avoid this, we only gave them initial instructions and uh, we avoided uh, interfering later on by providing additional instructions. And this was a little bit weird because I did have to warn participants that I wouldn't be able to say much afterwards. I would just ask them to continue reading, thinking aloud, uh, and so on, because in some cases they did have questions, and it was a little bit odd to say, look, I, you know, I just cannot say much, you know, much more really, but I, I did warn them uh, so that they wouldn't uh, be surprised about, about this. And I do think the practice leaflet helped uh, a lot in the sense. It helped um, to get them familiarized with the procedure and to um, make them feel more, more, more confident um, about uh, thinking out loud. So the practice leaflet was just a, another leaflet uh, that was related to a health topic, but it was a, an unrelated topic. And um, we um, expected them to have completed three successful utterances before moving on to the main leaflet. So in other words, obviously, we didn't um, ask them to read the whole practice leaflet, just uh, once um, they had completed three verbalizations successfully, we moved on to the to the main leaflet. Um, if I noticed that they were not really verbalizing their thoughts initially, or maybe they skipped a, a mark, an asterisk, I stopped them and I reminded them to um, uh, that they should continue thinking out loud. And in some cases, I just um, reread the instructions or, or parts of the instructions. And I should say that there, there was quite quite some variation in that some participants were much more talkative than, than others. Um, in some cases, some of the less talkative ones did um, start talking a little bit more and verbalizing their thoughts after the practice uh, leaflet, but others, you know, just didn't really talk a lot. So there's not much you can, you can do about this really, uh, in my experience at least. So the interviews were recorded and transcribed verbatim. And we um, used uh, Envivo. I'm sure some of you may have heard about the software, or if not, um, you may have, uh, in fact, you may have used it yourselves uh, to analyze the, the interviews. I did find this quite helpful. I also um, was, had no experience using Envivo at the time, but I, I really 
um, thoughts. Uh, I felt it was worth uh, learning because it did really help me a lot to structure the themes, um, organize things and, and so on in a way that would have been much harder to do manually, I think. So we analyzed the interviews using thematic analysis um, and we used this approach to identify, analyze and report themes. So again, some of you may have heard about this. If you haven't, or if you are considering using thematic analysis, I would definitely recommend that you have a look at this paper by Brown and, and Clark. This uh, is a classic by now, it has been widely cited. Um, and basically you can see there the steps of the, this is taken from the paper, uh, of, the, of this established procedure that involves six um, iterative phases uh, that you have to follow until you reach the final um, sort of thematic uh, map and you um, write up the, the report. So um, I read obviously all of the transcripts, but there was also another um, collaborate uh, a colleague in the in the project, uh, a co-author, Dafina Petrova, who also read all of the transcripts. Um, I was the one who generated the uh, initial codes and searched for initial themes and sub-themes. And then together with Dafina, uh, we reviewed the themes and sub-themes as needed, and we agreed on definitions and names. And then finally, the thematic map was discussed iteratively uh, with the other co-authors as well, uh, who indicated whether the themes were adequately represented by the quotes or not, and suggested alternative themes were relevant. Um, so as I said earlier, this was all new to me, so I looked for examples in the literature, and I noticed that this is done in slightly different ways, um, in that in some cases two researchers work independently on the transcript from the start, uh, on other cases one researcher uh, only works um, on this using a framework that has been agreed with other researchers. And as I said, I'm not really an expert. I'm not going to recommend the best way of, of doing this, but I think we managed to achieve here a good compromise in this project between rigor and the amount of work that um, is involved, obviously as well, considering the, the goals of our project. So here you see a summary of the results. We identified six different themes. The first two were linked to difficulties in interpretation, and there were a number of sub-themes under each of those two different themes. You can see them, you can see them listed um, on the slide. Um, the second two were linked to um, negative reactions, and the final two themes were linked to positive reactions. And um, something that I think is worth highlighting here is that we had some debate as to whether we should report the number of participants who had shown evidence of a specific misunderstanding or a specific negative reaction in the paper, because one of the co-authors actually suggested this. Mm, but finally, we didn't do so, because really the goal of the qualitative step here was to identify relevant patterns of meaning independently of uh, quantifiable frequency measures. Uh, that was what the survey was um, aiming to achieve. Um, so after some debates, um, we, we, we just focused on, on reporting the themes and, and explaining the, the meaning and so on. Uh, but I, I should say uh, also that Anna Manzano, who organized this, this data today, uh, kindly provided advice on this issue based on her expertise. And that um, definitely helped uh, to sort of uh, bring um, to the table some arguments when I was discussing this with the co-author who uh, wanted us to report the, the frequencies. Um, in terms of the quantitative survey, I'm not going to go into the details because obviously this session is on qualitative methods, but just to give you a very brief overview, we recruited over 600 women in this case who were eligible for cervical screening. Um, we had a company called uh, Norstad in this case who helped us with the, with the recruitment and uh, we used quotas for age, education and ethnicity to ensure diversity in those um, in those demographics. And we piloted the um, survey um, in Qualtrics. This is the, the survey platform that we use to program the survey online. Um, so we um, had 20 participants who went through the survey uh, before we uh, launched it with a 600. And I would strongly also recommend you to, to do so because even if you've looked at it uh, lots of times, there's always some small thing that you may miss, uh, something that needs to be adjusted. Um, now, in terms of the items, what we did was to develop items that corresponded to five of the six different themes that um, we had identified in the, 
in the interviews, uh, assessing misunderstandings as well as positive and negative reactions. And also we checked existing literature um, to see if there were any um, items that out there that we could maybe use that, have, that had already been developed that were related to some of the misunderstandings that we had identified. So we did find just a few um, in, in a paper that specifically assessed um, knowledge um, um, around um, the HPV, um, but mostly we, we had to develop our own items. So uh, it became particularly important to ensure that items were interpreted as intended. Uh, therefore, we conducted three rounds of cognitive interviews. I referred to this uh, to these briefly um, earlier on uh, to test the survey items. Okay, uh, and then finally we arrived at our final set of items that included nineteen true or false, uh, true or false um, statements uh, for open-ended items, as well as um, well, basically for each of the uh, items assessing. Um, comprehension, uh, people also needed to indicate how, how confident they were in the accuracy of their answer. Okay, so those were the confidence ratings. So um, how did we uh, go about um, with the um, uh, interviews to test the survey items? Uh, well, in this case, we used a combination of think aloud as well as concurrent probing in this case. Okay, so basically we asked participants to think aloud while they were trying to answer each of the items. But in this case, um, I also probed them for further details were relevant. So we had a combination of proactive probes that were designed before the interview to search for potential problems. Things like, was that hard or easy to understand? Why do you say that? as well as reactive probes uh, that were basically developed during the interview in response to participants' behavior, such as, you know, tell me a little bit more about that. We also asked participants to suggest um, alternative uh, wording for items that weren't clear or confusing. And uh, following each pilot round, as I mentioned earlier, we had um, four participants, um, and we had three rounds. After each pilot round of four participants, we revised the items with all authors to reduce reading barriers, also considering um, feedback from, from the participants and to ensure that they were um, interpreted as intended. Um, something worth noting, by the way, is that um, we also included a practice task for the think aloud procedure in this case, but given that participants were not going to read the full leaflet afterwards, it didn't seem to make a lot of sense to give them a practice leaflet. So in this case, we just used the standard um, practice task that is used in the literature, where uh, basically we asked people to try to think aloud while they were answering the question of how many windows they had in their house. And this did quite, this did work um, fairly well in my, in my experience. And I would also encourage you to have a look at that paper listed on the, on the slide if you want to read a little bit more about how you can conduct cognitive interviews to test survey items um, specifically. So here you can see um, an example of uh, one of our items, just to give you a, a sense of how they look like. Uh, first, uh, participants read the relevant uh, information in the leaflet. And then there you can see the true or false statement in this case and the confidence um, uh, rating that I was referring to earlier uh, below the, the item. So if you're curious about the findings, you can read more about them in the paper. Um, Today, what I would like to highlight is that the, the mixed method approach allowed us to actually uncover common misunderstandings of the NHS leaflet, uh, which may hinder informed um, decision making. And in fact, um, Public Health England invited me to share um, the findings in uh, some of their patient information review meetings, because at the time they were in the process of uh, revising the leaflet. As I mentioned earlier, there's a new version that um, is out there at the moment. So they considered our findings uh, in the process of revising the leaflet, which was really nice. Um, I should say, though, that uh, only the interviews had been conducted at the time. So I did insist that it was important to be cautious because we didn't really know how common some of these uh, misunderstandings or reactions were. And then the survey eventually allowed us to determine that. Something worth highlighting um, as well, though, is that, of course, as with all studies, there are limitations. Um, and uh, three that I would like to highlight or, or share with you uh, are that, first of all, the think aloud procedure has some advantages, but it's also 
um, I think one of, one of the main disadvantages that it has is that, as I mentioned earlier, there's some variation in that participants are just not too talkative. It's hard really to access their, their thought processes um, or the difficulties that they are experiencing. And there's not, not much you can do about it. At least I, you know, in my experience, um, you cannot push them too much. I, I, you know, I don't think that would, obviously that would be um, the right thing to do, needless to say. Um, so, you know, sometimes you just have to go with what you, with what you have. Um, sometimes even if, if, even for those who are more talkative, um, I found that sometimes it was hard to infer whether they had actually really understood something or not based on their verbalization. So that's something that sometimes required sort of going back to the team and saying, what do you think, you know, look at this uh, statement, do you think this reflects a misunderstanding or not? So it was not clear cut in all, in all cases. Um, the second point uh, in terms of limitations relates to the MARC protocol in itself, uh, because uh, this can introduce bias to the extent that it can encourage comments at specific points in the text and not others. Um, having said that, if I had to do this again, I would definitely go for the MARC protocol again. And another um, limitation to consider is that despite our um, iterative pretesting using cognitive interviews, um, some survey items may have not been interpreted as intended. We cannot really rule this out. And this means that maybe some of the <clears throat> incorrect responses uh, to the survey items may have reflected issues with the items themselves rather than issues understanding the leaflet. Uh, but, you know, we, we did try very hard to come up with the best set of items that we could. So, uh, you know, hopefully that didn't ha happen too, too often. So some final thoughts um, and reflections just to conclude. Um, maybe some of you, if you're thinking about um, doing some mixed methods work and you have no experience uh, or, or um, yeah, background on this, uh, you may find it a little bit daunting at first uh, to think about how you should go about conducting the interviews, to develop an analysis plan uh, and so on. But I would certainly say that it's worth the effort. Um, uh, yeah, I really, I, I really thought that the insights from both the interviews and from the survey were, were, were really valuable. Uh, and it would have been hard to make some of the claims that we did uh, make in the discussion section of the paper and so on, if we hadn't had, if we, if, yeah, if we had only conducted the interviews or if we had only conducted the survey. Um, I should say, though, that some of these stages, um, the interviews uh, in particular, took me longer than, than I expected uh, in terms of uh, particularly the analysis, uh, but also thinking about the protocol and so on. But as I said, I, I do really think it's worth the, the effort. Um, there are lots of good resources that are available out there. I um, highlighted a few references that I found useful, but you may find others uh, out there as well. Something worth emphasizing, by the way, as well, is that we got very positive and, and constructive, uh, constructive feedback from reviewers of the paper, so that was quite uh, encouraging to see. And if you're stuck with some particular point and you're still in doubt, I would encourage you to check with experts. As I said earlier, Anna Manzana was uh, really, really helpful and she and she offered advice um, uh, concerning specific aspects that I was um, unsure of. And if you plan to uh, use this approach uh, or parts of this approach at some point and you are unsure about any aspects and there's anything I might be able to help with, feel free to, to get in touch. Um, you have my contact, um, my email address there. You can also find me on Twitter. And otherwise, I hope this was helpful for you. And I wish you the best of luck with your uh, PhD research. <laughs>